record. Yes, okay, we're good to go. So, the last time, if you remember, Oh my God, look at this. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, good. Right, so we ended with, 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 uh, with talking about um, this model by Lau et al, right? That, that, oh. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, so, right, this one. So if you remember, we, 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 we finished discussing this, this, uh, this model proposed by Lau et al, which claimed that, the, that the, the generator of the N400 is the MTG, okay? So the locus of the storage of our lexical representations, okay? connected with all the other associative areas of the brain and also part of this network where you see that Broca's area has this role of retrieval and controlling the, the, the retrieval of this representation based on the, on the linguistic input or the linguistic output. And then it would keep on communicating with uh, the anterior temporal lobe where you have the integration of the concepts the MTG, where you have the storing of the lexical representations, and the angular gyrus, which we haven't really talked about yet. And so it kind of represents something that we don't really know what's going, what's, what, what it's doing, but it will, will be one of, the, one of today's topics, okay? So we've seen that this, you know, with respect to M400, this problem does not explain everything. So it does not explain why you have and then for hundreds for certain linguistic violations, we don't seem to reflect a mere lexical problem, right? And also it does not highlight the specificity of Broca's area for syntactic processing or linguistic based processing, but just as a sort of a controller, a processing controller of at activating different representations. And also it doesn't say anything about the interplay between the N400 and the P600, right? Okay, so the questions we are, we are going to start from today is a question asked by um, Toma Guccia and Angela Federici, uh, who, who did this research uh, some kind of five years ago. And this is one of my favorite papers in neurolinguistics. Every time that I see Thomas, I always tell him, this is a very, very beautiful experiment and a very, very beautiful paper. So. Please bear with me. Right, so the idea, the, the question of this paper was this. Can we disentangle the contribution of BA44 and BA45 to linguistic computations, right? So if you remember, BA44 and BA45 uh, compose Broca's area. And in, uh, in the previous experiment, in a Zaccarella's experiment, we saw that um, they, that we had uh, a peak of activation for sentences with a verb in BA45, whereas a peak of activation for uh, phrases, prepositional phrases in BA44, okay? So they claim that also, you know, considering a lot of other evidence from other studies, that BA45 in a way it's more important for, um, for, for syntactic computation, for merge, whereas, um, yeah, whereas uh, BA45, so BA, BA45 is important for, for when you have to integrate the, 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 the lexical information about the verb predicate, for instance, with your syntactic structure, okay? But their question is, can we really find the selective activation for one of these areas and disentangle their contribution to syntactic and semantic processing, okay? So that's what they did. So 
So the task they employed was a very dumb task to identify the target word, okay? So for instance, the target word was idee, and they would listen to a sentence like this one, and then they, they had to press a button when they heard the target word. And this was just to make them attentive to the, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to the verbal material they would hear so that they would have to process the sentence they would hear and not just, you know, passively listening, thinking about what they did the previous weekend, right? Okay, and here's all the conditions they employed in this set of two experiments. And these are very interesting. So, um, the first one is a normal prose, right? Like the complexity of the regulation had shocked the unhappy kingdom, okay? It's kind of crazy, but it, you know, makes some sense. And then they had different other conditions that would sort of deprive the, the, the prose of certain features like its meaning in the anomalous prose, so the, the vicinity of the constipation had iron the uncanny wisdom. Doesn't make any sense, okay? Also a little bit weird. But you see that there are a lot of, a lot of elements that actually are preserved. Like for instance, the morphology, the verbs, so function words, and the fact that the same, um, the same category of words would occur in the same position. So you have a noun, noun, verb, verb, adjective, adjective, and so on, okay? And then they introduce another, another condition called Jabberwocky, uh, which takes the name from, uh, from the, you know, the famous poem included in Alice Adventures in Wonderland and also other poems. So the idea of Jabberwocky is to use pseudo words, okay? So words that don't exist, but still retaining some of the original features of real words, like derivational morphology, okay? So derivational morphology is what tells you that pandexity is a noun, okay? And la la larization is a, uh, probably the verbal noun, right? And then you have some uh, um, inflectional morphology, like an, you have the infix an, that it's, uh, you know, you, you might know it's like a sort of a, um, reversative suffix, right? Affix, we talked about that. And then you have G, Jabberwocky 2 and Jabberwocky 3, where they selectively removed these features. So here you had inflectional morphology, but you don't have derivational morphology anymore. And here you don't have any morphology anymore. You only have function words, okay? And then you had other, other um, manipulation like random word order, which would just take the same words as in the normal prose, but scramble them, right? Sorry, the same words as in the anomalous prose, okay? So this would be... Uh, a comparison to the anomalous prose that takes away the, the compositionality of words, okay? Because you have vicinity, the, of, had constipations. So you cannot make phrases as you could here. Even if vicinity doesn't mean anything, you can still make a, a DP, the vicinity, okay? And then they did the same with Jabberwocky. So they, they scrambled the order of the words, Pandexity of the head, larization, walked on the job, and blah, 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 okay? So you see there is a gradient of, uh, of, of basically getting information out of your prose, okay? Is this clear? Do you see this clearly? Good. So, and then what they did, yeah, so AP anomalous prose, Jabberwocky with derivational morphology, Jabberwocky without derivational morphology, and Jabberwocky without derivational or inflectional morphology, okay? So inflectional morphology is the inflection of the verbs, the nouns. Derivational morphology is what those kind of operations that you use to create nouns out of verbs and stuff like this, okay? 
Right. And then the random, or, uh, the random word order as a control, okay? So basically when you have random word, or, word order, as in many experiments, you don't, you sort of um, prevent people from creating a normal syntactic structure of the sentence. Okay, and then they have a factorial design. And so they use these, these different conditions to have some comparison. For instance, you might say that in the anomalous prose, you do have some semantics because you do have content words with a meaning. Of course, the prose does not have a meaning, but still you have the words that mean something and you also have uh, your syntax because you can, you can build up structures. And then when you move to the random word order, you get your syntax away, but you still have your content words. If you move to your Jabberwocky, you don't have the content anymore. And if you move to Jabberwocky random order, you don't have syntax and you don't have content, okay? You still have some morphology, that's the idea. So they did this and what they found was basically in your uh, yellow contrast, which is anomalous prose versus random order, so including semantics, beautiful activation of all your semantic network with your inferior frontal gyrus areas. So this would be BA44, 45, 47, your anterior temporal lobe, and your angular gyrus, or something in the surrounding of your vernicus area, right? So some, some parts of the, of the probably STS, STG, and your angular gyrus. Good. Then what happens when you take semantics away and you only consider Jabberwocky versus random Jabberwocky, you see that your, your yellow area here, your anterior temporal lobes, which are supposed to have some, con some conceptual information, they're completely removed from your activation. The angular gyrus kind of goes away and you're left with your beautiful BA44, BA45, and some of your probably STS, STG, posterior STR, STG, okay? And then if you zoom here, you see again the same activations that Zaccarella found. Cluster in BA45, cluster in BA44, okay? So this should, is supposed to be kind of syntax, and this is supposed to be kind of syntax semantics. Okay? Fine. But not good enough. Oh, see, I even put the label. Right. So this, I, I said SDGM and TG, but it's actually the anterior part. So it's like the anterior SDGM, TG, and the temporal poles, basically. Whereas this is the classic PSDG with a piece of angular gyrus. All right, so still activation of BA45, okay? So they were like, okay, we really wanted to find the pure activation of syntax. But so the pure activation of, of BA45 maybe, but we still have BA, sorry, of BA44, but we still have BA45. So why, why is this the case? Why if, if they assume that, that syntax, that pure syntax, pure syntactic composition is in BA44, why did I get this? So either they were wrong or there was some semantic information that was still present in these conditions, right? Now, my question for you is, what is this kind of semantic information? What do you think in these conditions could carry some semantic information? even in the, in the Jabberwocky prose. Do you have any idea based on what I told you? Hint, read at this sentence. Syntactic contrast with no meaning, but inflection and derivation of morphology. Yeah, so it is um, inflectional and derivational morphology can indicate what kind of word, what category and stuff uh, it is. So. Right. And if you know something about the category, right, that tells you something about the semantics of these words. 
especially the derivational morphology, right? Because in the derivational morphology, you have stuff like, I don't know, uncanny or unbuttoning or what, what was there? Uh, Vicini, no, sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, not really, like pandexity, Lazarization, unheggy. So you don't know what unheggy means, but you, you might try to, you know, uh, your brain might try to come up with some operation of reverse, reversing the meaning of something that you don't know. But like pandexity might remind you of some words that you know that ends with exity, right? So it might be some kind of, uh, I don't know, some abstract concept that you have no idea what it is, but still it tells you something about, about that. So yes, that was the problem. At least that's what I thought it was the problem, right? So morphology brings some information about the meaning, some very abstract information about the meaning. So they said, okay, let's try to get rid of that as well and see what happens. And then they employed the condition that I showed you before. So the JP1 and JP2, which is a, like a, a impoverished version of Jabberwocky, right? And JP1 uh, with um, derivational morphology and JP2 with no derivational morphology. So all that was left was inflection, just to sort of drive your composition at least at some syntactic level. And surprise, surprise, yes, they found that when you keep the derivational morphology in, you still get the activation of your BA45, BA44, and posterior SCG. But when you get the derivational morphology away, finally, you get your beautiful peak of an activation in BA44, okay? So again, by the contrast of Jabberwocky without derivational morphology, and the same condition with random words, random order, sorry, random order, you get the selective activation of BA44. So the idea is that you really have to get rid of all the information, the possible information about the meaning if you want to have a pure activation of BA44. And this is gonna tell you that probably this is the area that is really responsible for, let's call it merge, or syntactic structure building, okay? So I, any, any comment, any question? I heard some, okay. So, you know, whether you believe on or not that this is actually the case, that you can actually isolate specific function in a specific area, right? So even Frederici would argue that if you talk about syntax in general, you have to include posterior SDG and inferior frontal and, and, and BA45. But the idea is that if you're really, really restricting the kind of information that your brain is processing at the moment, then you can get a selective activation of that area that's really, really, really selective for that kind of information. Pure syntax, BA44. So I think this is a nice experiment because it shows you that by employing different conditions where you selectively get rid of certain features of the of the stimulus, you get uh, like a more restrictive activation and then you can manage to zoom in in the A44. So the, the conclusion was that yes, no activation on the A45 where there is no derivation morphology, high specificity of the A44 for syntax, and activation of the A45 even just for some derivation morphology when it's when it comes into play, when it's included in your sentences, right? And we know that BA45 is involved in semantic processing along with other areas like LATL, left anterior temporal lobes, but also angular gyrus, also the whole uh, middle temporal gyrus, probably the inferior temporal gyrus as well, and probably the posterior part of the STS and STG, okay? So, Cool. So let's move to another example, another experiment, which was 
more focused in investigating semantics and specifically semantic composition. So the question was, what is the locus of semantic composition? Okay. So, right. So this is an MEG experiment. And um, this is a uh, part of uh, Lina Pilkanen's group in uh, NYU. So they have a lot of experiments um, run with different contrasts and different conditions. And she just wrote a nice review, uh, a couple of review papers. Uh, so the last one is from 2019. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some, some data about that. Uh, but uh, e you can find it on the on the article pool, okay? I think I haven't uploaded it yet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it back in. So this is just one of their experiments. And um, I guess this one was being in St. Pilkan in 2012. So what did they do here? They studied the composition of two words, okay? So two words could be something like non-word dish, vegetable dish, Tomato dish, non-word soup, vegetable soup, tomato soup. And they found when this area here, which is again, anti left anterior temporal cortex, so the most anterior part of your three temporal gyri, plus the very, very uh, edge anterior edge of the temporal cortex, which is called, again, LATL, or just anterior temporal poles, okay? They're poles because they're kind of the knee of the, of the temporal lobe. Um, so what, I, what they found is that just focusing on, on this region, you get, you got the higher activation for tomato soup and tomato dish, and a much, much, smaller activation for dish and then a slightly higher activation for uh, vegetable soup and vegetable dish okay so vegetable dish should be here vegetable soup is here sorry tomato soup yeah tomato soup tomato dish vegetable soup and vegetable dish so what does this thing tell us does it is it like something that tells us that people process tomato more intensely than vegetable? Not really, right? I mean, that maybe that would be because I don't like vegetables in general, but I like tomato. But with all the words that I employ, the idea is that the more specific, the more specific the second word is, the more processing you need to have in order to compose the meaning with the previous word. The more general it is, the less processing you need, okay? So, yeah. So based, based on this kind of, of results, and then we are gonna go through that again, more in specific, they, were, they asked this question. So what is the kind of composition that is performed in, in um, left anterior temporal lobes? Is this some sort of syntactic grammatical composition? or we might say some logical semantics composition, or it's more something like conceptual composition. So creating an image of a tomato dish or a vegetable dish, starting from the word tomato and dish, okay? So they run a few experiments and a few studies investigating this kind of question, but what I'm gonna show you today is this nice study comparing numerals to let's say, uh, adjectives predicating some, some, uh, some visual features about the objects. So two cups versus red cups, okay? So again, when you compose two cups, what you have to do is to integrate the meaning of the quantifier two with the meaning of a cup and have two cups. If you had red cups instead, you need to work out a little bit your conceptual representation in order to compose the meaning of something being red and something being a cup, okay? Now, interestingly, at the level of formal semantics or logical semantics or compositional semantics, 
at the grammar level, there is, there is very little difference between these two guys, except that with numerals, you probably have to add more operations, like you have to turn this into a generalized quantifier, and then you have to do some logical computation in order to make up a group of numerosity two, right? Whereas with red caps, you really have to do some conceptual work. You have to conceptualize a red cap, basically. This is kind of trivial. So here's their experiment. So they had either a color phase or a number phase, right? So the stuff that, that people saw was exactly the same. They would see two red caps, right? And in one condition, they had to say, to name the color. So all they had to do was to name the color and the object of what they would see. So they would see this, they would have to say red caps. In the number phase, they had to name the number, to produce the number, okay? So they would see this, they would, say, they would have to say two caps. And then they had a condition where they just had to list the stuff that they would see based on the color, so red, white, or the number, two, one. And it's clearly kind of self-evident, right, that, that this was the control condition for this, right? Because this represents a list and re this represents a condition where you need to compose the meaning of the two words and same for this. Here you're just listing stuff and here you're composing. And this is a trick that they will use over and over and over in a lot of experiments, just as a lot of other people did, okay? But the cool thing is that they would run this experiment with MEG, which magnetic encephalography, which as you might remember, uh, basically gives you both the advantage of a very high temporal resolution of the EEG and the very good spatial localization power of the fMRI. It's like a super fast fMRI. Okay. So, right. So the task was produce the right constituent. And what they found is that your LATL is significantly more active for color phrases compared to number phrases. So if you subtract what happens with the color phase from the number phrase, you get this big, 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 big activation of your, and now you can see it very well, of your left anterior temporal poles, okay? Or left anterior temporal lobe. And also some activation of the more posterior temporal cortex, okay? And uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, so if you look at the, at, the, um, at the track, basically, of the signal, you get this very nice effect of color phrase popping out in your left ATL compared to all the other conditions. And even the number phrase was not significantly different from the least condition. So it was really, really, really composing red and cap that would give you this effect, okay? So this doesn't mean that your um, LATL doesn't work at all in these other conditions, but just that it, it's activated more in the color phrase condition, which means that probably that is the area where you perform a specific process, okay? So take a message, LATL, left anterior temporal lobes, conceptual composition. Is this clear? Any question? Okay. So yeah, so to conclude, this area reflects conceptual combination rather than other type of, of semantic composition. And uh, now, if you, if you look at this, at this review paper, there are many other examples of other experiments uh, where they have a very, very similar um, manipulation. So in this experiment here, they compared uh, red bots where you have composition, composition with uh, pseudo word bot 
with cap bot again a list task and uh, pseudo word bot so even a, a, a more basic experiment compared to the other one and what they show again very very similar effect so this would be your latl see your beautiful temporal pole left temporal pole and you would have at about 200 milliseconds this burst of activity for red bot right compared to the other bots both maybe both okay now interestingly in their experiments there is another area that pops up all the time and it's not your broca's area but it's this area here which we haven't really talked about which is ventromedial prefrontal cortex okay so if you remember what ventral means is like inside your cortex right and medial means towards the medial line of your brain so this vent ventromedial area would be so sorry ventral also if you remember the picture of the dog or the fish would be towards the belly right so if this is your brain ventral would be the belly and medial would be towards the middle of the brain whereas your broca's area would be in the external uh, sorry your broca's area would be in the external surface right your vernicus area would be back here your ventromedial would be someone like here cool so yeah same activation in your ventromedial prefrontal cortex but as you can see from your from this nice graph this would peak at about 350 milliseconds so kind of 100 milliseconds later com compared to the activation in latl okay so that's you know this tells you something about the beauty of the mg because in an fmri you wouldn't be able to find this effect okay and you can see here this is your peak of activation in your LTL and this is your peak of activation in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex now you might wonder what the hell is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex right so I haven't told you we haven't really talked about lesional studies we are going to do that the very last class but if you have semantic dementia okay you have a selective impairment of your temporal pulse and the deficit that you have is that you struggle at naming uh, names of individual concepts or individual persons for instance okay so we know that it's it's probably a lot of people say that this is a, um, a, a cortical hub that sort of collects all the information from memory and sensorial cortices and it kind of binds them together to create a concept and then it's probably connected to the lexical areas in order to retrieve the the concept starting from the word okay but your ventral medial prefrontal cortex it wasn't really famous for this kind of lesions in fact this was more an area involved in emotions emotion processing or uh, like decision making and uh, fine you know economy processing and economy based decision making okay so that's that's quite interesting now that i think about that we actually encountered this area already when we were talking about the experiment on unbuttoning a shirt versus uncorking the wine versus unchilling the the un unchilling the thirst right so that was to there was the experiment that challenged the Haggard's Dutch trains are white experiment, and they found the activation of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, for the for the linguistic violation of using an in a in a verb that would not allow that to be used. Okay, so we we found that already, and it's popping out in all these experiments. So we introduce it in our nice semantic network. Now, 
this was in comprehension. But the interesting thing is that if you replicate this experiment in production, and even with sign language, so in sign language, you would ask to uh, utter a phrase like white lamp compared to a list of green and lamp. And the same in production, you would ask your, your subjects to produce white lamp compared to a list of words. Okay? And what you get? Again, activation of LATL and ventral media prefrontal cortex. But this time, if you see, no, you don't see because I haven't told you. So again, you have the effect of phrase versus list. Okay? So you have it from the difference between the darker column and the lighter column. So this and this. So this would be in uh, sign language and this would be in spoken language. Okay? And this is in a window from 200 to 250 milliseconds. This is from 330 to 450. But now, look, you get the same effect, regardless of the modality, in both areas at the same time. So interestingly, when you, when you vary the modality of, um, of processing from comprehension to production, in comprehension, you got that the first area becoming, like lighting up would be your LATL and then ventral your prefrontal cortex. But if you move to production, you actually get that both areas are active at the same time. Interesting. So that's also, you know, something that you should bear in mind that the, that tells us something about the flexibility of the system and also the priority of the activation of different areas. All right. Finally, and here's, this is something about the first experiment that we showed, uh, the tomato dish versus vegetable dish, right? Tomato dish elicits stronger activation in LATL. Why? Because they claim that the activation in LATL correlates with the number of conceptual features that are shared between the first and the second word. So when you go, when a more specific meaning like tomato integrates into a word from a context, right? So you get tomato, you set up your tomato context, and then you get dish. And then you have uh, a lot of specific features matching, whereas when you have a vegetable dish, could be any kind of vegetable dish, so it's a, it's a more, it's a less specific concept, you get a higher activation for a more specific context. And this again suggests that what really the LATL does is to sort of collect information from all the other area in order to build up a specific concept and to integrate the features of the, of the two words, the conceptual features, okay? So very cool, very interesting. All right, so if we, can, if we integrate this with the things that we, we have seen in the previous episodes, right? We see that your left anterior temporal lobes probably house conceptual composition, derivation of complex predicates, and composing the concept of different words, and it operates quite early in comprehension. Your ventral media prefrontal cortex reflects a more general combinatory composition, because you remember it was also active for linguistic violation. And at least in comprehension, it seemed to operate a little bit later. So probably, you know, in the, in the kind of the range of the N400, right? Although we don't really know exactly what the N400 reflects, probably also the contribution of these areas. And then you have your BA45 from the experiment we just seen that operates some sort of basic syntax driven composition. So more on the, on the linguistic side. And it's recruiting a broader semantic network. The idea is that it's a sort of a uh, ensemble director or orchestra director, which sort of um, mediates and, and tells the other areas what to do. And then, of course, you need your lexicon and you need your STS and MTG more on the posterior side, but then, you know, spreading towards uh, the whole MTG 
uh, to access the lexical meaning of words, okay? Now, you see it's not super precise, right? So you might wonder, what is the difference between a concept and a lexical item? And we might talk about this forever. The idea is that a lexical representation binds conceptual features with some more linguistic features in order to be used in a sentence. Whereas a pure conceptual representation is really about some sort of binding of sensorial, memory-based, and, and motor features, okay? And also the lexical representation probably is more connected to some sort of acoustic representation of words or phonological representations. Okay, so again, pulling all this together, here's a nice temporal activation or temporal spatial activation model for a semantic network proposed by Pilkan in 2019. And also, so you have these important hubs, angular gyrus, posterior temporal lobes, anterior temporal lobes, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and your left inferior frontal gyrus that includes 44, 45, 47. Okay, so yeah, so the idea is that first of all, you have your angular gyrus popping up, which is sensitive to the argument structure of the verb, and then it kind of interacts with your posterior temporal lobes. And here you see, even Lina doesn't really know what to say about that. Combinatory effects, syntax, I would rather say lexicon. And then your LATL does some combinatory conceptual work. And then the, your left inferior frontal gyrus activates and process some sort of like movement, long distance dependencies, and along with the, your ventral medial prefrontal cortex, some sort of combinatoric effects, okay? Right, so any question about this or any critics or anything about this model that you don't like? before taking a break. I actually have a question. Yes, right? please. Uh, so about the two cups experiment, uh, which, which area did they observe an increased uh, activity in? So there was a, in the uh, color phrase condition, there was an, an increased activation somewhere, right? Right, so the color phrase is this blue line, right? Right. So the idea is that the color phrase is the only condition that is different from the other ones. Right, so I'm wondering about the number phrase condition because supposedly there as well, you have some combinatorics going on. So maybe not in this uh, region, but somewhere there should be an increased activation there. Uh, that's in, that's triggered by combining words, which is absent in the color list condition and the number list condition, right? right? Did so, they observe anything like this or? Yeah, so that I don't remember. Hmm. Probably, um, I mean, in these graphs, I don't really see anything that, uh, because this is, I mean, I don't know what I, what I copied. I should, I should look it up, it's a very good question. Um, so yeah, just let me let me answer your question first, right? So you are saying, and that, that that's actually that I've been what, what I what I've been also wondering for for some time, like, what do you mean by 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 the fact that you only combine stuff with red cups and you do not combine stuff with two cups, right? So this tells us something about the 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 vagueness of the term combinatorics, which is one of the reasons why I hate it, right? So I, I guess what, what they are referring here, and, and actually they're, they're more precise when they discuss their results, is that this is really conceptual composition. Mm -hmm. So something like conceptual combinatorics. And, and you know, in this kind of definition, combining two and cups would be more like some uh, semantic, uh, logical-like combinatorics, okay? 
So yeah, I, I, I can get that idea. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The problem yeah, is, but that, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it, but the, regardless of this, there must be some area that's sensitive to combining words in general, right? So I, I don't know if if we predict the color phrase condition and the number phrase condition to behave similarly, but there but but there must be something that's that distinguishes the number phrase condition from the list conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know if they found it in their, in their, in their, in their paper, yeah. but I'm going to look it, I'm going to look it up again, but like, you know, to, to answer your general question, we have seen a lot of experiments where people yeah. look at combining stuff, right? So mm -hmm. if we go back to, I mean, I don't have it here, but the, the Zaccarella et al. experiment, they were looking, uh, on like, uh, on the, on the ship, right? versus drink the water something like this and they found that when you have a so very very minimal sentences like three word sentences right mm -hmm. and, and they found that when you have the verb your ba45 pops up whereas when you have um, when you have a prepositional phrase your ba44 elicits the peak of activation mm -hmm. right so Frederici, Zaccarella, and these people claim that VA44 and 45 is the locus of, of composition in the brain. Right. And, uh, and uh, Pilkanen does not deny this, although she found very rarely effects in Broca's area. Mm -hmm. So she's not denying that, that, that Broca's area is important for composition. In fact, she claims that, sorry, that what you have in Broca's area is probably some sort of basic syntactic driven composition, right? So you have your, your, your syntax build, building up the structure and probably your, uh, you know, verb uh, argument agreed being saturated or stuff like this, right? But then when it comes of creating new conceptual representation by, combi by combining uh, simpler or more basic representations, that's really what the LATL is doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Probably yeah, working with, yeah, the, yeah. with the ventral media prefrontal cortex, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. right. Now, thanks a lot for your question because that, that exactly helps me pointing out what I wanted to say, which is, okay. isn't it weird that the Broca's area is active after the, the conceptual composition hub? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You would yeah. expect from any theory, whether it's linguistic or non-linguistics, that you first figure out how you actually have to sort of combine two words at a grammatical level, and then you interpret them, right? Mm. But if you look at the timing of this activation, it's exactly the other way around. So as if, you know, you hear red cup, you kind of, you know, in, within very, very few milliseconds, you ignore the syntactic information, you think about what that might mean, and then you actually perform some syntactic com com um, composition. Now, of course, she, she wouldn't claim this, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people do that. A lot of people say, yeah, that's, that's the evidence that syntax does, doesn't exist in the brain. Everything is semantics. Uh, this is not really the case, because then if you look at, at the ERP experiments, and then you, found, you find these very, very early effects, like, LAN or, or early LAN right after 150 milliseconds, right? Mm -hmm. So the game of, 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 of telling who's first and who's second is kind of, a, it's kind of a tricky game, especially because another thing that I should say is that uh, in fMRI experiment, this area does not really show up very easily and that is because the temporal lobes are kind of in a place that is not very easy to investigate with fMRI for a series of reasons, one of which I think there is some air somewhere here uh, that, I mean, you definitely have air here, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this air kind of distorts, distorts the signal, that creates distortions and prevents the the fMRI signal to be to be to, to detecting like the activation of the blood in that area okay I see. the oxygenation mm -hmm. of the blood so I mean a very you know take on message with MEG 
you, you're very good at finding the activation of these areas. With fMRI, it's not a very good methodology to get activation of the LATL. Then you can use uh, PET, for instance, position, uh, position, uh, positron emission tomography. So you inject some radioactive stuff in your blood, and then you measure. That you use it as a as an emitter of of signal, and then you measure the signal basically, right? That binds, for instance, to the glucose. So then the areas that that are consuming more glucose are more sensitive to this. Um, tracing mole molecule and then you get more signal from these areas okay so this is something that people have to consider and have to be careful uh, careful about in different methodologies are also better at investigating different areas but you know i think this is a kind of a sort of a nice picture of you know many areas that are involved in in, in semantic processing and and you can also see kind of different different tasks and different jobs different areas do and the difference between the let's call it uh temporal pole territory or latl territory your broca's territory and your wernicke's territory right uh, the functional difference between these areas is actually quite strong from lesional studies and from lesional syndromes or from impairment syndromes. So again, semantic dementia and the last stage of Alzheimer's dementia would affect your semantic memory and your naming of specific content words and nouns, okay? If you have Broca's, Broca's aphasia, you have a strong agrammatism effect and also production, language production, but also language comprehension, although Semantics is still quite, especially lexical semantics is still quite good, right? If you have a strong impairment of uh, Wernicke's territory, including posterior STG, posterior STS, MTG, and the angular gyrus, you get a strong Wernicke's uh, phasia, very strong impairment of lexical, of lexical semantics. So you don't understand the words you hear because you cannot get to the meaning of, of the words you hear and all these symptoms are usually uh, way way more attenuated after the acute the acute phase so after two or three months uh usually the the the, 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 the most severe symptoms go away and then you're left with some milder symptoms which are still related to this okay so there is a very strong uh, correspondence between lesional studies and activation studies in in this respect but then, you know, then, then of course, the picture is not so clear as we would like it to be for a plethora of reasons. One of the reasons is that lesions are not as precise as, as we would like them to be for investigation. So, for instance, the original Broca's patient did not have a pure Broca's lesion. He had a widespread Broca's lesion, which would also interest some temporal regions and also the insular cortex and also this this you know the frontal operculum and other areas here so you know you always have to be cautious and with lesional studies you always try to uh, intersect the lesions in many patients but they have also way more widespread lesion than what than what you, would you think same problem for uh, functional studies it's very hard to find a pure task that would tap on a specific function, right? And we see them, for instance, by the use of anomalous prose as something that sometimes is a control for a normal prose and sometimes is a control for a jabberwocky prose, right? So, you, you know, you really have to be careful with that. So sometimes people claim that they are investigating a semantic effect but they're actually, you know, putting in a lot of conceptual effects or syntactic effects. Likewise for syntactic processing. And, we, and that's why I like the Gaucha study a lot, because that would show you that when you think you got rid of all of your semantics, still, if you have derivation morphology, you're going to find activation of some areas that is supposed to do some semantic processing. Okay? So, you know, 
the situation is not that clear and and you know we have a lot of uh, there's a lot of problems with these kind of models but you always have to think about the most likely model the most the most likely you know the most likely uh, um, the most likely anatomic of functional model that would be consistent with the evidence that we have from functional studies from lesional data and we also see from some sort of um, information that we have about how these areas are connected. And we are going to talk about that in a second, okay? Was I clear? Did I make any sense? Or I was, I was, I was too vague? Okay, good. So let's take a short break and let's meet in five minutes. And let's continue our trip to the semantic network. Newer has yeah 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 I mean if you you know uh, oh I'm gonna pause the recording okay good yeah my interconnection is stable thank you okay so right so I got a question which kind of vanished but it was an interesting question so. The question was by Noor, what would happen if we had a, an ERP experiment on, um, why this is not working? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Sorry, my microphone was dead earlier. Okay, okay, no worries. Sure. It's okay, yes, I managed to. Yeah, so, um, right, so the question was what would happen if we had the two color, the two cups versus uh, the red cup experiment, right? Probably not much, probably nothing. Probably you wouldn't see nothing because with, the, with EEG, you need sort of strong contrast in order to, to find an effect. The MEG for certain things is more sensitive, right? So, yeah, one of, the, one of the possible answers to this question is probably nothing. Another possible answer is probably you would get a negativity, right? You would get a difference in negativity and, and you know, one of those two conditions we are more difficult to process would give you some sort of uh, more negativity, probably a, a modulation of the M400. The, the reality is that I don't know. But the, one of the reasons for using MEG for this experiment is that MEG is much more powerful also at identifying the locus of the activation, okay? All right, so let's continue because we are quite late. Right, so taking stock. If you remember, we had this nice picture of, of the uh, wernicke jeschwin model, right? Where we had our Broca's area as the motor images of word, Wernicke's area as the auditory images of word, and your concept center somewhere, right? Now we know that Broca's area is more concerned about linguistic syntax, and Wernicke is more about lexical and, um, and semantics. But we also know that concepts are everywhere, especially semantics is everywhere. I mean, everywhere, at least in these areas that we have seen, it's, they are very important for specific semantic processing, like LATL, BA45, and we should also add 47, uh, Wernicke's territory, especially STS, MTG, and ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Okay, this is kind of where we left. So, I kind of anticipated this issue already, but the idea is to ask, is this coherent with what we know about language impairment? For instance, we get deficit of language comprehension with the damage at Wernicke's area, right? And we have seen this a little bit 
So in Minder's review, the idea is that you get a real Wernicke's aphasia where you have a, a strong impairment of comprehension, not when you have a selective damage of Wernicke's area, considering Wernicke's area as this part of the, of the superior temporal gyrus and this part of the supramarginal gyrus, which seems to be very specific for uh, phonological processing. But you get Wernicke's aphasia when you get a widespread damage, including all these areas um, highlighted in, in, in um, circled in green. Okay, and if you see in Binder's model, the the red areas are those that are concerned with the meaning of words, semantics. So this would be our. LATL, this would be our temporal cortex, MTG, ITG, STG, STS, anterior, posterior, right? So the STG is really at the border, you see. But then there is this area here, which we really haven't talked about, right? So what is this? What about D? What is D? Does anyone want to try to answer? Is it the angular gyrus? Bingo. At least it includes the angular gyrus and some other areas. So the angular gyrus, what is it? Where is it? There you go. This is... Um, kind of localization of the angular gyrus. Uh, I mean, it's kind of controversial and also it's not very stable across individuals, but the idea is that it's called angular gyrus because it has this nice turn and it spans through the whole supramarginal gyrus and a little bit of your uh, superior temporal gyrus, okay? So it's right behind your Wernicke's area, and it's right behind this guy, which is the supramarginal gyrus, okay? So now let's play a little game. Ha! So these are some interesting areas for language processing, okay? And now I'm gonna ask you to help me, tell me what they are. So, first of all, where is the front of the brain? Here or here? Left or right? On the left. Right, because here we have the cerebellum. And then you see the temporal pulse. So what is this? Broca. Very good. What is this? This is a little bit tricky. But you might remember that in your, this little, little thing in your superior temporal gyrus. Anyone? Alice, wanna shout? No, no, I'm not sure, no. Okay, so this is tricky. I, 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 I wouldn't be able to, I mean, I would say STG, but it, this is actually the Heschel gyrus, your primary auditory cortex, okay? If you remember, is right anterior to your Wernicke's area. So if this is your Wernicke's area, I told you that it's composed by the supramarginal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus. Then what is this? I tell you, it's the supramarginal gyrus, okay? very important for phonological processing and phonological retrieval. And then we move behind the supramarginal gyrus, that is our angular gyrus, okay? So you see that here is a little bit smaller than in the previous picture. Sometimes it's actually considered to be bigger than this. Sometimes you, you include also the, 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 in, the, uh, Par, 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 um, parietal uh, temporal junction, 
which is basically where, where the parietal and temporal lobes get together, or the inferior parietal lobe, which would be kind of this, right? This is the whole parietal cortex. So anyways, it's kind of here. And this is your posterior STG, the one that was active for all those phonological experiments that we, and, and speech processing that we've seen, but also with some important syntactic functions. Right, so your Broca's area would be this, and your angular gyrus would be this, okay? So you might be wondering why is the angular gyrus important? Well, for instance, because this region is non-existent in lower primates, lower primates, okay? So if you look at uh, cheese, they have uh, they have a kind of an, an homolog to the angular gyrus, but much, much, much smaller. So if you look at monkey's brain or or non uh, non human uh, ancestors, like the very first Australopithecus, they have um, in their brain the frontal and parietal lobes are much, much less developed, whereas the temporal lobe is still quite developed, okay? So usually you would say that in primates you have all the associative cortex that are smaller. It's not actually completely accurate. It's really about the frontal and parietal cortex that are less developed. And, and we know that the frontal cortex is very important for reasoning, for high-level function, and for language, and the parietal cortex for, um, for instance, uh, tool use and the knowledge about tools and knowledge about uh, temporal events, event processing, and these kind of things, okay? Now, if you look at this, yeah, you see that the angular gyrus is greatly expanded in human brains and it's anatomically connected to almost every other association regions, so associative cortex, and receives little or no direct input from primary sensor areas, okay? So the cool thing about the angular gyrus is that it's, it, it, it's receiving project, projections from all these high level processing areas, which do a lot of things like, you see Barocca's region via this tract of fibers. Um, this, this would be the middle frontal gyrus and superior frontal gyrus, high level cognitive functions. This would be your parietal lobes, tool use and uh, event processing. This would be your visual cortex and visual areas and also high level visual areas, right? So this would be your probably uh, associative visual cortex and the whole MTG, which you know has a lot of lexical and conceptual information, okay? So you see, this really looks like a hub collecting information from whole high level cortices. So it should be kind of important for high level functions. So something you might wonder is what happens if you have a lesion to that particular area? And the answer to this question is that you get the Gesterman syndrome, also known as angular gyrus syndrome. So we are talking about cases where you, you have a very, very selective lesion to the angular gyrus, okay? What you get? You get these four strange symptoms. Finger agnosia, you don't know which one is your, I mean, which finger, you cannot, uh, my God, categorize your fingers, okay? You don't know if this is your pointing finger, if this is your middle finger, regardless of whether you look at them or whether you, someone touches your fingers. So you have finger agnosia, right left disorientation, so for all those people who have problems to distinguish right and left, they might have some kind of problem at the angular gyrus, kidding. Um, then you get agraphia, you're not able to write. So the angular gyrus is very important for coordinating motor programs for writing and lexical access to the uh, uh, orthographic representations of words. 
but the thing that interests me the most is that you get Akaikulia. So Akaikulia is the, um, the lack of the ability of making very basic mathematical operations, like adding numbers, counting numbers, multiplying numbers, subtracting numbers, and so on, okay? So this is really cool because that shows that this particular area is very important for your mathematical abilities. So this paper by RD line 99 uh, reports on one patient, just to give you an example of what usually happens if you have this kind of lesions, 50 year old male patient with the ischemic lesion to the left angular gyrus, right? So this is, specular because it's a radiographical um, uh, convention. And you see that this red stuff here is due to a lesion of this area here, which encompasses the angular gyrus. You see, if you compare it to the right hemisphere, you have, a, you have an atrophy of this area. So how what kind of symptoms this patient presented in the acute phase in the days immediately following the ischemia he presented loss of speech expression and comprehension so global amnesia uh, global aphasia okay he could not speak and he could not understand anything so something that you would usually get if you get a damage of both Barocas and Wernicke's area. However, this only lasted a few weeks. After a few weeks, he showed great improvement of linguistic skills with only some, some mild deficit of um, recollecting like uh, names for nouns, right? So mild anomia, but he was still presenting these kind of deficits, some difficulties in understanding logical grammatical relationships, comparison adverbs, like bigger, smaller, place time adverbs before and after, okay? So this might give you some, some hints to Yasu's question, which is where is logical grammatical processing? Where do you process numbers? Maybe the angular gyrus plays a critical role with that. And maybe it plays this role along with other kind of representations that are present in the frontal regions, more specifically BA45 and 47, okay? But the interesting thing is that after a few weeks, this patient recovered much of the linguistic skills, so he didn't have global aphasia anymore, not even Wernicke or Broca's aphasia, but some my semantic aphasia that would interest uh, this kind of, this kind of um, understanding, like logical grammatical relationships and, and these kind of adverbs which require some sort of abstract comparison, okay? And also place time adverbs that suggest that also this area is very important for integrating information about event processing and place processing, so these kind of representations and connect them to linguistic representations, okay? So that's quite interesting, I think. Right, so in another paper by Seeger et al. in 2013, there's actually this kind of nice picture that tells you what the role of the angular gyrus could be. Multimodal, multifunctional integration. So it receives multi-sensory input, which is already processed from associ associative areas, right? Like for instance, selection planning, semantic constraints, semantic combinations in different modality, semantic concepts, semantic form, but also attention, action, memory, saliency. So he, he proposes that also with some kind of predicting coding, right? It modulates all these all this networks communicating with, for instance, the hippocampus for the memory, the attention on the superior parietal, the numeracy intraparietal sulcus, 
So many people claim that the numeracy faculty is actually in the intraparietal sites rather than the angular gyrus, and the angular gyrus is just modulating this kind of information. Semantic, anterior temporal frontal, comprehension, middle temporal, and a lot of other stuff, okay? So I think this is a nice, a nice picture of, 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 of this kind of multimodal hubs in our brain. Now, remember that I just told you that the, the ATL is considered to be a hub, right? A multimodal hub. This kind of label is used for many other areas, like for instance, the angular gyros, okay? Good. So, uh, would you like me to go on for like 10 more minutes? Or you're tired? Because we started like a little bit later. Okay, good. So, we'll finish this one, so then we're really done for today. So, uh, for those who were attending Grochinski's lecture, the very first thing he presented was this, some some notions about this paper by Hutt et al. in 2006, 16, which was kind of famous because it is the paper that gives this picture of the brain with all the words written on the brain. And Grochinski was very critical because he said, this is a typical example of an, a pure associationist, associationist approach to language, ignoring that there are certain areas that actually do some more specific linguistic processing. Actually, I think that, that this paper, it's actually quite nice because I'm going to show you why, but the simple, the simple message is that all those areas that, that are some kind of involved in some general aspects of linguistic processings did not show any, any specific selectivity in, in this paper. So, you know, the idea that you have some areas that are more linguistically domain general like syntax, lexical semantics, conceptual semantics, it actually kind of fits nicely with, this, with these results. And I'm gonna show you why. Somebody asks, semantics combinations are by any chance similar to semantic associations? Uh, I would say no, right? So the idea is that, I mean, yes, of course, there is some similarity to that, but they are not exactly the same thing. So the, the difference lies in the fact that when you mention semantic combination, you sort of compose the meaning of something like a cup and the meaning of a predicate like red, and you build up a novel representation, a novel concept of representation constituted by a red cup. Whereas association is just a, something at a much lower statistical level. It's basically, you know, if you hear red cup, you associate, for instance, all the representations that are related to red and all the representations that are related to cup. And then you combine, if you want, the, the, you know, the, the overlapping activation of these associations, and then you get an overlap uh, picture of, an overlapping picture of the associations that are common between these two words. So you see the difference between the two approaches, right? One would say that you combine certain features from one concept to the other, and then you create a novel concept. The other one would say, no, the creation of a novel concept is just about noticing which are the activations in common between the two words, okay? So it's slightly different. But yeah, good question. So. This paper is more about associations. So what they did, very simple. They had seven participants um, listening to the Moth Radio Hour, which is basically a radio program about tales and stories, for two hours, while their brain was scanned under fMRI. That's it. They didn't have to do anything. Just listen to the stories. And the goal of this study was to build a data-driven model of semantic network from cerebral activation. So they would just record the cerebral activation during the listening of the stories, and then they would do some computation to extract uh, what they called semantic dimensions. So how are these dimensions computed? Now, I don't wanna go into the details, but the, 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 what they did basically was to extract some lexical features from the corpus, and then make a, cortic, a cortical map 
of the activation of the, of the lexical features in your brain. So they took, right, so took a big corpus, they extracted nine, 985 features by grouping two words, co-occurrences, okay? By selecting those two words that would co-occur together. So pure statistical data-driven um, computation. And then they would run a regression on how these features considered together affect the vote response. So the hemodynamic response for every vote voxel, which as you should know, indexes the activation of a certain voxel. The voxel is a three-dimensional pixel of your cortex, right? A little piece of your cortex. So actually what they did was to run a principal component analysis on the lexical features to build up some larger semantic dimensions. So these dimensions were computed by uh, investigating these 10,000 words, including the story, and clustering them in 12 distinct lexical categories via using these semantic dimensions. So this is a kind of computational technicality. We are not gonna go into the details, but the result of this crazy computation was to get these 12 categories of words, so visual, tactile, abstract, numeric, locational, violent, communal, emotional, social, professional, mental, and temporal, okay? And then they would see for every area, which area is selective for one of these, two, for one of these categories, okay? correlating the response of the, the brain activation to, every, to, the, to the contribution of every single word with respect to these categories. So what they got at the end of the day was this. By projecting the semantic dimensions on single voxels, they obtained a pattern of selectivity which parts of the brain are mostly selective for just one dimension, okay? So being selective means that you, that this area of the brain would answer for, for instance, uh, school or car, but not, not for punching or red, okay? That's what selective means. Right, and that's what they got. Now you can't really see a lot of here, but what you can see is that these areas here, circled in white, are the, the most well-known regions for language. So this would be your Broca's area. This would be your supermarginal gyrus. This would be your Wernicke. This would be your angular gyrus. And this would be your superior temporal gyrus, okay? And you see that here you have a lot of activation in the more, in the more um, inferior part. part. Is, was that a question? Was that a question? Oh no, sorry, it's the return. Right. Uh, but yeah, so for instance, they wouldn't say that this area was selective because you see like it's kind of activating for, for, for any representation, which is I, like, for any word, sorry, for any, uh, for any lexical dimensions, which is, you know, an interesting thing. Okay, so now this is not telling us a lot, but I will tell you something more understandable. So yeah, Barocas and Wernicke's regions were not very selective. And the outcome of this was to build a semantic atlas. So which parts of your cortex are more selective for different linguistic dimensions. And, uh, and this was very consistent across subjects. So one of the very first important results is that the atlas they came up with was very consistent through, through subjects. And this can tell you, you know, one of the, the, one of the following conclusions. Either 
there is an innate architecture of your semantics network. So it's genetically specified or innately specified that the word red, which activates some, which be particularly activates some specific areas of your cortex, or that all the subjects they tested were, were sort of, uh, you know, immersed in the same environmental linguistic context. So this is not really innate, but the same environment resulted in the structuring of the cortex in this way. Now, leaving this aside, let's have a look at what they found, okay? So this would be just the unfolding of your cortex. And it's kind of tricky. You cannot really see a lot. But now you see that Broca's area is gray. So the colors here stand for the selectivity of one of these dimensions, okay? So maybe we should move at this. So let's move away from your right hemisphere, although you see that a lot of emotional, temporal, professional stuff, a lot of red stuff is in your right hemisphere. Let's move away from that. Let's focus on the left hemisphere, okay? So, sorry, already from this picture, you can see that, for instance, in your uh, inferior frontal gyrus here, you have a lot of abstract and uh, some also mental representations. Here you have some visual, locational, and tactile representation, and the emotional representation are more either here or here, okay? So you see there is some sort of interesting uh, subdivisions of your cortical areas. The other thing that you see is that the green stuff, for instance, is both here and here. The blue stuff is both here and here. The red stuff is both here and here. So there are certain areas that seem to be active for the same class of words. Now, moving to the left hemisphere, this would be your acoustic cortex, and you see it's not selective for any linguistic dimension. Your Broca's area is all gray, not selective for any linguistic dimension. Same for your sensorial cortex, motor cortex, and so on and so forth. So, right. So, I don't, I don't find your STG, STS, this is your inferior parietal sarcus, so where you have your kind of, kind of mathematical. Um, oh, yeah, there's the STS. The STS is a little bit outside this, but then you have actually some specific activation, right? So that's why I was sort of arguing against Grochinsky's reluctance of buying these, these results. I think these are completely comparable, compatible with Grochinsky's idea that Broca's area houses major syntactic processing because Broca's area is not selective for any, for any semantic dimension. Now, let's move to my nice representation of this. Sorry, it's a little bit <laughs> Italian, so <laughs> you will have to to sort of translate this into your favorite language. But yeah, I mean, these are kind of simple words to understand. So I use these kind of ideograms here or, or uh, symbols. So this would be your numerical lexical dimension, abstract dimension, professional, temporal as in time, tactile, visual, locational, mental, violent, buildings, social, and emotive, okay? So, this is our nice Broca's territory, posterior, uh, superior temporal gyrus, uh, A1, udito means hearing in Italian, S1, sensorial cortex, motor cortex, okay? So by looking at my nice representation of their findings, you actually can appreciate that this is actually a nice, a nice atlas of 
all the all the representation conceptual representation high level representation multimodal representation or s some sort of uh you know motor like representation maybe or something like this right but not pure motor representation not pure sensorial representation not pure auditory representation already some si sort of higher level associative cortex processing and then let's see what happens so near broca's area you get numerical representations i mean you get an answer to words that denote some sort of numerical meaning right so words that fall within the numerical dimensions you get it here and also you get a lot of abstract um, representations or ab or sensitivity to abstract semantic dimensions here visual dimensions here abstract sorry this was mental this is abstract this is numeric you move into the more posterior frontal regions professional temporal numeric visual tactile and then if you move ventrally you get some emotive and abstract computation in your ventral and insular regions if you look at what happens again in the in your temporal lobes which are kind of the hub for your conceptual stuff there's not a lot of activation in your temporal lobes, but as you move backwards, you get social buildings, probably individual concepts. And here in your posterior MTG and ITG inferior temporal gyrus, we have all this stuff again, violent, emotive, mental, visual, numeric, tactile, moving to your parietal cortex, which includes the representation of your uh, tool use and event processing then you get again numerical social visual places finally a lot of places processing here temporal and some violent so what this tell us that if you look at the associative cortices right they probably they probably encode some higher level conceptual information related to different sensorial modalities and when you hear when you comprehend when you process specific lexical items that recruit these kind of representations then they pop up with this kind of statistical analysis what you don't get is the more general linguistic areas and the more general sensorial areas and i think this kind of fits, fits nicely with the idea that you recruit a lot of associative representations where you're actually inter interpreting the meaning of sentences right so this would sort of be consistent with the idea of marta kutas that your whole brain in a way contributes to building up the meaning of things but the crucial point is that not all of your brain does it in the same way so you have more linguistical based domain general from the linguistic perspective processing in your brokers and Wernicke's territory and also probably your lexical your lexical areas and then moving away from then you have that your associative cortex is always lighting up a lot for your semantic dimensions so ultimately when you really compute the conceptual meaning of words you recruit a lot of areas which we categorize as higher associative areas okay selectively for different dimensions of words so i think you know this is not too bad this is not a bad idea of how how our how our semantic activation works of our semantic networks works someone might tell you yeah but this is not really semantics this is like i don't know tool knowledge right if you have a damage to this area you probably get uh apraxia you don't get aphasia you know which is you know at the end this might just be a terminology difference but there's nothing wrong to claim that all these areas are actually important when you build up the conceptual meaning of of an utterance and to appreciate how our brain moves from 
the more specific to the more general towards the processing streams. And I think this is more than enough for today. So next time we will talk a little bit more about this network and what specific areas actually do and associate and, and relate that to lesional studies and to other kind of uh, information, like for instance, the connectivity of these different areas. Okay. If you have any question, I'm going to stay here for a while. Thanks and sorry for the technical problems. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Have a nice day.